Well, I sit here with Lizette Schweppenheiser, right. which of course, when I, um, when I first saw the name, I kept saying it over and over. I'm sure you get it, right? Isn't there like a soft drink or something? Schweppes. Schweppes, mm -hmm. right? And so maybe that came from a Schweppenheiser. What, what is the, what's your background? Like what's Schweppenheiser? Well, Schweppenheiser is German. Uh, oh, it is? Yeah, yeah. Oh, very so, good. Um, there are still Germans in Germany with that last name that we didn't, Tom and I were in Germany. And Tom, of course, is your husband. Right. Who is sitting in here. Yep, he's yeah. over there. Um, we never met a Schweppenheiser. We couldn't find any back in the 70s, but my grandson found some recently. And, oh, very uh, good. I there. thought you were going to say, we never met a Schweppenheiser we didn't like. I thought that's what you're going to, and I haven't either. <laughs> we never I mean, met you're the only we two Schweppenheisers I really know, but absolutely. <laughs> and Jeff. So we got connected again, mm -hmm. and the way we did that was I got a call in the office. You guys came in actually first, right. mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we also then kind of reconnected because you came in the office. You said, we want to, we want to renew our vows. Right. Um, yeah. You didn't say Tom wants to make an honest woman out of me. That's not what you said. <laughs> no. But you said, we, uh, we, we want to renew our vows. Mm -hmm. And I was curious and, and like, well, that's great. But you, you needed, as we get into this, we'll unveil why. But this is, this is your 49th year together. Yes. And that's just a wonderful story. Well, tell us a little bit how you how you met Tom, how you guys came together. Okay. Well, we met back in the seventies, and that was the so time. you were hippies, or yeah. were you disco? No, we weren't disco. <laughs> Definitely not disco. No disco. We we were hippies, um, and it was back when there used to be a lot of house parties at people's houses. That's what people did. We didn't yeah, sure. go to the disco. Uh, so I was with some friends at the park, and some other people came down and said, "Hey, we know where this party is." So I we went, know this German named Schweppenheiser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we went to his house where he was having a party. His parents were away for the weekend, so uh -huh. he was taking full advantage of it. Kids, do not follow this recipe. <laughs> nope. Um, so that's where I met him. And then um, he asked me out after that, and we started dating. And Beautiful. Next thing you know, we were getting married. Next thing you know, you were getting... Isn't that funny mm -hmm. how that happens? And now it's 40 years. And then there's years. kids and everything mm -hmm. else that come along. It's yep. magical. Mm -hmm. But anyway... Um, it's good. It's good that we had the chance to do that. It was great to see uh, the family come together. We had a lovely mm -hmm. day, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful event. That's for sure. Best part, of course, at the reception was the music. You had classic rock <laughs> music playing. Yes. You definitely uh -huh. were hippies. You yeah. kind of were a hippie vibe, uh -huh. I would say. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, it was all good. Yep. Um, we sit here today, though, for a different reason, right? Mm -hmm. We sit here right. today. For uh, I would I would probably say a more sobering um, I don't want to say somber mm -hmm. because one of the reasons we're sitting here today is even when you and I and Tom were in the office and we were chatting and it took the turn because of what we're about to talk about mm -hmm. um, and there's tears and you know uh, the whole thing I have never once walked away from talking with you where I felt defeated or I felt all things are hopeless. It's mm -hmm. just this. Is, it's not fair. It's not right. It's not. Now, you may have gone through times like that. I, I mm -hmm. can't speak for you. But I can say for a guy that's dealt with these issues in the past with different people, normally where it ends up is a, is a whole different place than, than the way I've watched you in a very dignified, uh, a, a very Christ-honoring demeanor. You've dealt, you've mm -hmm. dealt with the issue that's in your life. And when I'm looking over at Tom, when, when you deal with this, um, this becomes the issue of your life. I, would, I mean, if you're eating oatmeal, you're eating oatmeal, but you're still thinking other things from time to time. Right. It would be hard to right. get away. Mm -hmm. Tell people what it was that's come into your life. Okay. Um, back in, in January of 2020, <clears throat> I wasn't feeling well and, um, you know, well enough I was feeling sick enough to stay home from work and for days. And then Tom said, you need to see a doctor. So I went to the doctor. <laughs> Is that he, how Tom talks, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> you need to see a doctor. My imitation of him. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but they sent me for blood work and then they called me and sent me for an ultrasound. What were you thinking at this time? Okay, so it sounds like, like you don't normally, you're like, I'm not going to a doctor. What do I need to go to a doctor yeah, for? I, I just don't feel good. Yeah, I was thinking it would pass. That yeah, it was right. some kind of stomach thing. And, sure. Um, you know, I thought, 
maybe it was my gallbladder or something right. something you know i don't want to say normal not that it's normal to have gallbladder problems but you know something relatively common and then they sent me to the emergency room and at that point they ran some more tests were know. they even hinting at anything at this time or were they just kind of they like... were saying oh maybe it's a gallstone okay. um you know there's so they found out there was um you know blockage in one of the bile ducts so they had to put a stent in to open that because i didn't know it um but i was yellow I, tom and i just didn't notice it because i guess we see each other every day my daughter came in at one point and said i looked like i had a spray tan wow um we just laughed that off but sure uh apparently you know i had a lot more going on so they put the stent in and i started to feel better at that point and then the, so the, everybody's happy now everybody's thinking okay you're feeling better yeah they still didn't say what was wrong sure so uh then i went for a, a procedure called an ercp which is an endoscopy uh where they go down and i guess to get it a little further in and um, after that procedure, I heard the doctor when I woke up calling Tom in and he said, we found something there. There's a tiny mass. It's probably, it can probably be removed or resectioned and uh, don't worry about it. You know, um, they sent me back to my room and then it was maybe an hour or so later, the, um, resident came in and he said, well, from this point on, we're, you know, we're going to assume you have pancreatic cancer. So that was, no, a wait, wait, wait. So, so. The latest report is, hey, we can handle this. Mm -hmm. So twice now, you've basically heard the lesser. Yes. Like, okay, yes. it's not a big mm -hmm. deal, you know, um, and and kind of relief. Like, okay, we found something and it's easy. We can, right. we can, we can just pull. handle this. Mm -hmm. But now you're hearing from a professional saying, yes. oh no, it's we're, we're going to treat this like it is pancreatic cancer. Exactly. What's the first... Tom was in the room, I take it, also at this time. Yes, What's your first reaction when you hear that? Are you denying it? Like, no. Well, maybe to a certain degree, but my other reaction to it was, I'll be dead in four months. That's what you first thought? That if, I, if it's pancreatic cancer, yes, because people I had known previously who had pancreatic cancer died rather quickly. Within four so months. So I was thinking, you know, four months, I'll be gone. So. And so in your mind, are you going through what you have to take care of then? Is that what you're doing or...? You did know, you cry out to God right there like, God? You know, I think I kind of did a little bit of everything. It was like all just gotcha. really quick. And I, sure. I probably wasn't sure I believed him. You know, the other doctor, I said to him, you, the, oh, the other doctor, doctor. You weren't sure if you believed the doctor. Yeah, point. if I believed this new doctor yeah. who just walked in and said I had pancreatic cancer or he was going to assume I did. Uh, because the other doctor just a couple hours before had said, oh, it's nothing. It's just this tiny, small mass. You probably get it out. You'll have to talk to a surgeon. So I don't think I fully comprehended it at that point. You know, uh, and then they sent me home a couple hours later. They said, okay, you can leave. There's nothing more we can do for you. Uh, and then I went to see the surgeon. Right. Um, and that was another shock because I still, I guess I was still in a little bit of denial thinking, this was something that could be easily removed. And then he comes back in. And we caught it early me. enough. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They caught it early enough. Um, I'm part of the 15 or 20 percent that can have surgery, um, you know, which was a good thing. So the surgeon comes in and he draws me a picture of what he's going to do to me. Surgically. Oh, this and, is that surgery. Yes. And it was really invasive, um, you know. Yeah, this is really radical. Yes. Uh huh. So it go is. ahead. What is it? Well, they slice you pretty much in half, and then they go in and they remove the cancer. They remove some lymph nodes. They remove your gallbladder. If they need to remove part of your stomach, they will. And then they resection everything back together. So uh, it takes a while for you to even be able to eat. It was probably two weeks after the surgery wow. before I could eat more than a teaspoonful of sure. food. Sure. Um, so it was a very invasive surgery but i was shocked when he told me that because i thought it was going to be something minor and he was like now and it's the only option for you you have to have the surgery so so now it keeps progressing mm -hmm. and now you're hearing from a surgeon saying uh this is what we're going to have to do right. Lizette. this mm -hmm. is this and you're going to have to get this right and so now what are you thinking is it changed at all at this point or are you still kind of running on 
it's all so fast and I, I can't digest Well, this. I asked him, I said, is, do you think this is cancer? And he said, well, 95% of the time it is, but you could be part of that 5%. So I was kind of hoping I was part of the 5%. Yeah, right, yeah. And Tom, he's always positive about things like that. He's saying, yeah, 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 you're part of the 5%. Yeah, we men have a way of yeah. downplaying things. <laughs> so, right? uh, we're so, like the Black Knight and Monty Python. It's it's a, <laughs> merely a flesh wound. You know what I mean? Right, That's right, the way we nothing. operate. Get up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we had about two weeks between the time I met with the surgeon and the time the surgery was actually scheduled. And, uh, you know, I prepared myself spiritually more than anything for that surgery. Yeah. Um, I didn't know. I did a lot of Google searches on it. And you know how Google can be. You learn a lot that you probably didn't need to know <laughs> and it was a very, very that the truth. scary surgery. Sure. Um, my doctor has a, um, my surgeon told me he had like a 98 percentile, you survived the surgery. So that was good because he told me like 15 years ago, it was a lot lower than that. To has anyone said anything to you now as far as prognosis? Has anyone said to you, hey, listen, I just want to prepare you and that kind of a thing. Beside the surgery, I'm talking about longevity of life now as a result of pancreatic yes. cancer. Yes, the surgeon, he said, we go in, we get it out, you have some chemo afterwards, and then you're good to go. So I still had a lot of hope uh, that it wasn't terminal because he's told me, you know, sure. you have this removed. He's got a lab coat, he's got a stethoscope. Mm -hmm. Everything he says yep. is true. And you have the, the chemo afterwards as a preventative yeah. And then you should be okay. Um, at least for five or six years, you should be all right. So I had a lot of hope there. I was more, at this point, I was more terrified of the surgery. Sure. Um, and coming through it. Um, so what? how long ago are we at now? Like when is well, this, this going this is February 2020. On? This is February 2020. Mm -hmm. So a little more than two years ago. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I had the surgery. Very good. And I recovered quickly. I had a really good recovery. I, mean, I was back on my feet going out um, within three or four weeks, you know, not really going out, going sure. out, but not for walking You're up and you're, yeah, yeah. I'm going for a ride in the car. Yeah, sure. Um, so I did recover quickly and uh, this is when COVID struck. So even my post-op wasn't in, in person with the doctor, it was a, um, a Zoom call. Yeah, right, sure. And he thought I was doing well. Uh, so then he said, well, now you need to see an oncologist. And she is the one that told me the truth. So when I saw the oncologist uh, on a Zoom. <laughs> so right well, now you're feeling pretty good. Right now I'm feeling pretty good. Like, I think we're going to beat this. Tom's feeling like, I think yeah, we're going to beat Tom this. Tom thought, it's done. It's, yeah, because Tom's over. positive mm -hmm. about it all. So yep. we're going to beat this. Mm -hmm. And so you had already started the process of blood work and all that stuff, or was that coming now with the oncologist? That was coming now okay, with the oncologist. Okay, very good. So now we're with the oncologist. So now I meet her, and we had a Zoom meeting, and it was Tom and I and my daughter and myself and the doctor on the Zoom meeting, and she told me, she told us pancreatic cancer has a super high rate of return, that most likely it's going to come back, and that they're going to do this really, um, what's the word I'm looking for, strong chemo, because uh, she thinks I'm young enough to handle it, so they're going to do the super strong chemo in hopes that that pushes it at bay and it doesn't sure. come back. Uh, so we set that all up, but I'm like, wow, this, you know, could come back. And Tom, of course, he was, no, yeah. no, it's not going to come back. They got it off. Okay. But one of the lymph nodes. <clears throat> well, let's wait for a second. Mm -hmm. You're a believer. Yes. You know Christ. Yes. How'd you come to know Jesus? Uh, well, I came to know him back in the 70s. Um, I guess you could say it was the Jesus movement the back Jesus then. people, absolutely. Yeah, Amen. yeah. We were up at this plaza hanging out and... Uh, Living in a commune. <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> oh, no. Wasn't that Je <laughs> no, Jesus that uh, people? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some people, um, some friends of ours that had been saved invited us to go to uh, the church that this one particular church, you may have heard of it, should I mention it? Fountain of Life yeah, uh, sure. in Burlington County. They had a big tent. They had bought a piece of property and they had a big tent and they were having revival meetings every night. But in their little church in Burlington, they were showing a movie. So Tom and I went, uh, the, the guy only wanted a ride, but he said, come on in, come on in. So we came in, we watched the movie. It was A Thief in the Night. <laughs> I know if you How many of you remember A Thief in the Night, A Distant Thunder, something hoofbeats? <laughs> um, 
there were jaws. <laughs> yeah. Was, if you watch it now, it's kind of corny. You yeah, know? it's all hokey, right? Yeah, but it, is. It, it was really impactful and powerful. It was. And it was the first time, even though I was raised in a Christian home or what we'd like to call a Christian home, uh, it was the first time I heard the message of salvation. Wow. It was the first time I heard anything about the rapture or wow. any of that. I never heard it before. And it was the first time for Tom, too. He never heard it before. So. Anyway. First you've ever heard about the rapture? Yes. <clears throat> so your mind must be going, yeah. Zzz. It was because, you know, I went to church. I went, you know, we went to church and we celebrated Christmas and Easter, but I never knew what Easter stood for. I never knew that it was actually, I Babylonian mean, I knew the Lord was resurrection, God. Yeah, amen. <laughs> resurrected, but I never knew it was for my sins. You know, oh, I never amen. knew that amen. the reason he, he died. So all of a sudden it became clear to you. Yeah. Yes. Wow. It became real. And the pastor, he you know, gave an invitation at the end and uh, Tom and I both made a beeline up wow. to the altar. And, that's and you got saved. saved. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, so you came to know the Lord, mm -hmm. life changes for you. Yep. You kind mm -hmm. of, and I'm sure there are times you're walking, there's times you're stumbling there, mm -hmm. uh, like most people go through. Yep. We had a lot of times. stumbling. Well, <clears throat> that's what happens <laughs> to a lot of people, right? Yep. But you still, Jesus held on, you mm -hmm. held on. And the next thing you know, um, your life, your life has been changed around. You know you're mm -hmm. set for eternity and yes. and all that. And you base it on the blood of Christ. Right. And you Absolutely. and Tom do. And, mm -hmm. and you guys have been walking with the Lord. You've raised your children uh, in the mm -hmm. Lord. And um, so it's just been one of those great, great Christian family stories overall. overall. Right? Yeah. There yeah. was a lot of bumps in the road and stress. I think away. everybody who's watching this mm -hmm. can can understand the bumps in the road. Right. But it's not the righteous man that stumbles and falls, though he may stumble and fall, what happens? He still gets up. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's where you are. Yes. So now you've gone through a salvation. You have your salvation experience. You've lived your life. Uh, I'm sure along the line, you've served in churches. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've done your thing in Christianity and you feel like, you know, God, I'm, I'm, I've given my heart, my life, my soul to you. Has there been a time, flash forward, Mm -hmm. That you feel at any point like God, why are you doing this to me? I, I've served you. I've, I've. I'm your child. Why would you do this? Well, you know, maybe, maybe that initially went through my head, but I think that the way the process went for me, that before I went to have the surgery, I wasn't asking why me. I was asking the Lord um, just to fill me with the Spirit and to take me through the surgery. And if I was to pass away on the operating table, I'd be in heaven with him. So you really so dealt with that thought? You I, really- oh, I did, I did. Even <clears throat> when I was when I was in the room that they, you know, that little room mm -hmm. they put you in when, when they're getting ready to wheel you away for surgery, um, I just kept praying and thinking that this could be my last moments alive. Wow. You know, when I said goodbye to Tom and the rest of my family, I was thinking I might not see them again, but I, knew because in the weeks coming up from the diagnosis to the surgery uh the couple of weeks i had there i just really really kept praying for the lord's spirit to fill me and keep me calm and knowing i had the assurance of where i was going to go i did want to wake up don't get me wrong i wasn't you know ready to leave but at the same time i was ready to leave yeah so, yeah I, I, you know whoever's listening to this whether it's because you're we're in we're going to be showing this in a couple of the services mm -hmm. and we're going to put it online and I'm hoping that people will discover it just because I think it's going to bring a lot of, not necessarily uh, whole answers or anything, but it may help mm -hmm. bring some clarity to people. And if you've just listened to what Lizette was saying, it's kind of like that juxtaposition. You're either going to depend and move towards God or you're going to kind of give up hope and and who can blame you right i mean who can blame you i i don't pretend to walk in your shoes or somebody's mm -hmm. shoes that are dealing with something so significant but sometimes people even with the most minor issues in life will well that's it you know god i tried you and you not you're not helping me and i hope that this has given you some idea now you did have an incident though mm -hmm. you were saying when your dad passed yes yes when my dad passed um i was I guess I was about 35 years old and it was sudden. He was at my house on Friday night or Friday, Saturday morning. He woke up, he got on a plane, he 
flew back to Florida, and then the next morning my mom called and told me he was dead. Wow. So um, at that time, I kind of just was that. I really asked why, why, you know? I mean, I wasn't sure of my father's salvation, and, you know, I had been talking to him, and he told me I was a fanatic and a Bible thumper, and, Mm. um, you know, I just wasn't 100% sure where he was going, even though he professed the faith, and like I said, we were raised going to church. I didn't know where he stood because he thought I was so fanatical, Yeah, and uh, I kind of just, I think I grieved the Holy Spirit, Mm. because when I would reach out, when I prayed to God, I felt like there was a wall there that I couldn't. Sure. get through or that God wasn't coming through. And I think I was just so angry that I was grieving him. And it took me a while. It took me a, a few months to come back from that. So when this happened to me this time, um, this is like probably the most traumatic thing that's happened to me uh, in my life, I guess. And I decided to run into God's sure. arms rather than away. Wow. And How'd you tangibly, like, just give me some tangible ways when you say I ran into his arms. What does that mean to you? Like, what do you give me a summation? What does that mean? Okay, for me, for me, it meant that I I did a lot of praying, soul searching. I got into the Bible. Um, you know, I was just reading everything I could get my hands on. Was there um, anything that stood out to you reading wise, like scripture, a, a book that meant something to you, or was there anything that stands yeah, out? Yeah, there. You know, it seemed like every time I opened the Bible, <laughs> that there would be a verse and uh, that would would speak to me, but. Yes, there are a couple verses that, um, more than a couple, but, yeah. you know. Uh, well, we have a Bible. Yep. You wanna, yeah, I, do you want me to? I believe you know one mm-hmm. of them right here. Yeah, so. I don't know it by heart. Well, that's all right. <laughs> okay, one that um, in Proverbs, uh, and everybody knows this verse. I think it's a pretty famous verse. Look or, both ways before you cross the street. <laughs> no, not that no. one. No, it's, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Mm-hmm. And this is a verse that um, I've known all of my life. I have, um, I have an aunt that would every Christmas card, birthday card, she always write this verse in Proverbs there. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Yep, Proverbs Amen. 3, 5, and 6. Well, what makes it so particularly special? Going through what you're going through. Because it's telling me to put all my trust in God. Don't lean on what I know, what I can understand. Wow. I don't know why this is happening to me. I know it happens to a lot of people. Um, and, you know, God, he knows everything. He you know, knows the number of hairs on our head. And yeah. he knows when our time's coming. And it's all part of his plan. So... I just like that, that trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. Don't, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about whether I understand why it's happening or not. Mm-hmm. I just need to worry about what God wants me to take from it. Do you find that you have people around you, friends or family, mm-hmm. that want, they, they, it almost is like, would you be a little more intense about this? Like, would you care a little bit more, you know, because your attitude just seems to be (laughs) so, yeah, I know you do, but your attitude is, and this is what I find so intriguing. This Mm -hmm. is why I wanted to talk to you about this because I've, like I said before, um, I've dealt with many people Mm -hmm. and in, in dire circumstances. And usually there's a level of, you know, God, and yet you are so serene about this. Like, you give me so much peace in my heart in the middle yeah. of a storm that I, I just find it mm-hmm. intriguing. Well, you know, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I forgot what the question. No, you had one more set of oh, scriptures I did. there, please. I did. Yes. Okay. What my question was to you though is, um, do you have people in your life that will say, That's right. "Would you that get a it. little bit more mm-hmm. intense about this?" I think what I have is. You know, people in my life, like Tom, who wants me to stay very positive about sure. it, and he sometimes takes my um, calmness with it, yeah. my acceptance sure. that if the Lord's going to take me, he's going to take me. Right. He, he sometimes takes that as, I've given up. Right. And I haven't given up. I'm doing everything the doctors tell me to do. Amen. I go out, I walk in the park, I get a lot of exercise, um, you know, I take all the medicines they give me, I get all the tests, I go for the chemo, so I haven't given up. It's just that, you know, 
I've accepted that if the Lord's going to take me, if it's my time. Mm -hmm. Have you run into any Christians uh, and uh, brothers and sisters who question your position on this? In other words, are they saying, well, you've got to have more faith. He's going to heal you. Have you dealt with anybody yes, like I that? Yes, I have. I have. Um, well-meaning. Yes, well-meaning. You know, you just have to believe that the Lord is going to heal you and you'll be healed. And, you know, I have that hope. I do have that hope that Wonderful. the Lord will heal me. But at the same time, I want to keep it even bounce. I don't want to be, um, I don't know how to say it. I don't want to be caught off guard at the end and say, oh, Lord, I you know, be disappointed and say, I thought you would heal me. And now I'm, now I'm in heaven. Healed. Yeah. Now I'm in heaven. I, <laughs> oh, won't care, right? I can't believe Lord. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So share so, with me the other yeah, verse. Yeah, sure. The, uh, the other verse, um, let me find it here. Okay. The other verse, I've liked this verse and I've read this verse many times over the past year. And sure. just the other day, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine, um, sent an email out to a group of us ladies that pray together and she included this verse, and it reminded me again how much I like this verse. It's a couple of verses, actually. It's Romans 5, 3. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So, we glory in tribulation. Mm -hmm. Wow. But please... Yeah, I, you know, so this, this spoke to me because, um, and, it, you know, I'm going through some tribulation. Um, there's no way around it. Um, it's not something I can go pay for to fix or anything like that. I have to deal with this. And it's building perseverance in me. And I think the whole process, when it started in January, it's been a, it's been a process. Yeah. You know, if they had given me the diagnosis at the beginning... I probably would have reacted a little bit differently than I am now because it's given me perseverance, which has given me hope. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hope in the Lord, hope in His Word. So the Word of God speaking to you, mm -hmm. you obviously you have people around you praying for you, praying with you. Yes. It's all support system I have, for you. I have a great prayer support system. I have so many people that mm. are praying for me. I have... A lot of people write from our church that are praying for me. They yeah. pray for me all the time. Um, the pep group, they've been real faithful in their prayers for me. Um, the ladies group I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Tom, he goes to uh, a couple of men's breakfasts. Yeah. And they're praying for me. And, of course, my other children, um, their church is praying for me also. So I just have a huge support group Amen. of Christians praying for me. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Let's go back now. Okay. Let's pick up our story where we kind of left off of it. And that was with the oncologist. Now you're going to talk, and you had mentioned that the oncologist was, I don't want to say the first one that was real honest with you, mm -hmm. but obviously the oncologist was the person that kind of laid it out to you. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, pick up yeah. there. She, she told me that it's a high rate of return, um, that they do this chemo up front um, right after the surgery to try and um, prevent that from happening. Uh, so I had the chemo. I started off, I had a rough time with this really strong chemo she wanted to give me. So she took me off that and put me on something else. And I was on that chemo for about four or five months. And then I developed something called pneumonitis, which is kind of like pneumonia. You can't mm. breathe real well. And, um, and this is all during COVID. Yeah, this is all during COVID. So all these mm -hmm. things are factors. Mm -hmm. How? Like, so you start... Up to this point, tangibly, the surgery, I don't want to diminish the surgery, mm -hmm. but then you, now you're, now you're dealing with this, this intense chemo. Right. Um, so now what's going on faith-wise with you? Uh, are you still mm -hmm. pressing into the Lord at this point? And is it really kind of like, Lord, it's, I, I need you more now uh -huh. than I've ever needed you through this whole process? I still, I was pressing into the Lord, but I still didn't necessarily think it that I was going to die anytime soon. Okay. I mean, I thought maybe four or five years. Um, and it was kind of hard because we weren't coming to church. We were watching online and you were up there by yourself. Yeah. I know. It was very sad. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was difficult because yes. we, you know, 
we did a lot of phone calls and we kind of cheated and got together with family when we yeah. weren't supposed to be Amen. doing that but kind of stuff. Ahead. But um, it was just a, it was a kind of hard time all the way around because, yeah. and COVID didn't make it easier. No, nope. That's for sure. It, it made it more difficult. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, so now the oncologist says to you these things and you went through the chemo, mm-hmm. any, so what was, where, where do you sit now? Okay. Well now after that chemo, when I got the pneumonitis, she took me off the chemo and then she said, okay, we're just going to take you off and do CAT scans every three months. So every time I went to get a CAT scan, it seemed like something was amiss. Um, at that point it was October of 2020 and I had a CAT scan that showed some kind of lesion on the liver. So I had to have a liver biopsy and that turned out to be a different cancer. It was not the pancreatic cancer. And she said it was a really slow kind of like skin, like kind of like skin cancer, not the bad kind, um, not to worry about it, that that wasn't going to kill me. So then I went to January and I had another CAT scan and everything was clear. Everything was clean. She said, you're good. You know, there's no evidence of disease. So that was at all, for, none at all. So Wait a minute. A so for celebration. So yeah. So, mm-hmm. so now you're feeling, did she warn you and say, sometimes this happens and no, she didn't say sometimes this happens, but she still kept up with, you know, optimism. It, you have reason to be optimistic. optimistic, but she's, it still can return because that's how this cancer The nature works. of it. So you leave. And when was this February? That was January of 2021. January of 2021, Mm -hmm. uh, so a little more than a year ago, Yep. Mm -hmm. and you leave going, I have reason to be optimistic. Yes, yeah, Tom and I were celebrating, you know, I beat this maybe, (laughs) so uh, three months go by and I have to have another CAT scan, and at that point she says there's some kind of mass. um, That much time, three months. Yeah, three months, she said there's some kind of mass growing back in the pancreatic, in the surgical bed. So they tried to do a biopsy of that. They couldn't get anything. Uh, the doctor, the um, gastrointestinal doctor did that biopsy and he said he couldn't find anything. So she said, well, let's just let it ride. So we waited another three months, went back. And again, that had grown. Um, but she said, okay, well, let's, you know, it could just be scar tissue. It could be this, it could be sure. that. We're not going to really worry about it. But in the meantime, I started having pain. And, I, and you kind of knew? I, kind of, I guess I did because I yeah. got, started having pain in that area where the pancreas is, what's left of my pancreas. And, you know, I had to take, you know, ibuprofen and Tylenol yeah. and things like that for the pain. I was doing that. And every time we went back for another CAT scan, so that was maybe, I'm trying to think, it was maybe midsummer, um, another CAT scan, it grew a little more. And then we went back again in November, another CAT scan. She, then she wanted me to have an MRI. So I had the MRI. And so at this point, they discovered again. Well, they're, yeah, they're thinking that. So it was January of this year. Okay, so a few months ago. Yes. Mm-hmm. When I had the CAT scan that showed the new liver lesion. Um, and she did another biopsy on that. And that came back as positive for the pancreatic cancer. It was the same cancer. That so now pancreas. you have to have a very frank conversation. Yes. So we have this conversation with her and I can just be thankful to the Lord. We're back in a doctor's office now. We're not yeah. on a Zoom meeting Amen. anymore. Uh, just made it. So little- do you go to that doctor's meeting thinking the worst or do you go thinking the best? I went thinking the worst. Okay. And so you and Tom go mm-hmm. and she's there and she wants to talk with you. Right. Right. And, and I had done research before and I okay. had a lot of questions like, what about, you know, a uh, cyber knife? What about this? What about that? And she just kept repeating herself. No, no, no. Pancreatic cancer is a systemic disease and you can't just treat it in one spot because while you're treating one spot, it could be cropping up in your lungs. It could be cropping uh, up here or there. So the best way forward is just to do straight up chemo. Because I was talking about targeted chemo where they just sure. do the chemo. Yeah, 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 right. And, Makes uh, sense. She said, no, she's just straight chemo. So I came out of that very depressed. And this is where it hit me the most. Did she tell you? She told me I was stage four and that I had three weeks to 12 months. That's back. what she told you That's back then? That's what she then. told me in January. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you sit here today. Yeah, uh, four months in. 
you know, almost five. the sort of Damocles mm-hmm. almost kind of like above your head. Yes. Like the idea is my life could end at any time. Yes. Yeah, it could. It could. You know, I yeah, don't think right. it's going to end tomorrow. Amen. Unless- so, so then you said something though, and I'm sorry I uh-huh. stepped on you, but you said um, that's when it kind of hit you or that's... Yeah, that's where I was hit the hardest. I felt, there you, go. you know, it just really became real that I had very little time left. And, you know, when she said three weeks to 12 months, I was thinking, wow, I won't be here for next Christmas. I won't see my grandkids grow up. I won't see their graduations or their weddings or, you know, anything. I didn't even know if I would see Jeff and Kata's new baby because he hadn't been born yet. Oh, (laughs) yeah. uh, You know, there was a lot of, that's when I did most of my crying. And the two of us kind of cried our way home. Uh And it was hard to tell my family because they all got very emotional too. And it was just a really... Difficult time. It was a difficult message to give to anybody. Was it a dark time or was it just a sad time? I think it was mostly sad. It could have been a little bit of darkness trying to creep in, but I pushed it away. Amen. Just kept praying How'd your faith, is that what it was because of faith? You know, you're just still going to trust, mm-hmm. trust in the Lord with all your heart. Yes. So were you still just I, I exercising was. that? I was doing that, yes, because I think over the past two years that my faith has just grown stronger over the past two years. Amen. So even though this hit me like a ton of bricks, knocked me down for a minute, you know, I was able to get back up. <sighs> and I did go for a second opinion because mm-hmm. I thought, well, you know, I better get a second opinion and see if they say the same thing. And basically they said the same thing. Um, so I stuck with this doctor because she is forthright and she, I've been with her now for yeah, two years. Right. And, you had another opinion and mm-hmm. said the same thing. What are you going to yeah. do? And he, the second opinion doctor gave a few more things that might be able to happen. And I took that back to her and she knew as soon as I walked in her office, she said, I see you had a second opinion. Um, and she said, I'm glad you did that. Amen. She said, right? I wouldn't have expected anything less. So, um, you know, I told her what the doctor from the University of Penn had said, and she agreed that, you know, at some point we might be able to try some of these other things. So um, we started the chemo again, the end of um, January. Yeah, I know we scheduled this kind of around Around it. So you're in the middle of it now, Yes, dealing with it. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Pretty good now. Um, You know, I wouldn't have been able to do this on the weekend. I was, you know, I have the chemo on Wednesdays and I get pretty sick on Saturday and sure. Sunday usually. Um, yeah, it's interesting how it works, right? Yeah. You can almost like clockwork figure it out, mm-hmm. can't you? Yep, because it gets, yeah. I guess, through my system. And... So as you sit here today, mm-hmm. you, you're, you've you heard the diagnosis that it could have been, well, you've, you've jumped past the weeks and the first few months, and now you're, you're just thanking God for each day? Yes. Well, I did. I told you I started the chemo. I had a CAT scan a few weeks ago. Um, the chemo is doing something that the tumor in the liver has shrunk by 50%. Wow. And the mass in the pancreas has also uh, shrunk. I don't know what the percentage of that yeah, is. Yeah, right. It's not as um, great, but Amen. it's shrunk. And I, the pain has pretty much subsided. And it, although I have the side effects from the chemo, I feel... A lot better. Wow, uh, pain wise. It, it, well, that's mm-hmm. awesome, right? It Praise is awesome. The Lord. It is and because I, even as the days remain, none of us know the days, right? right? They're, the Lord counts them. We mm-hmm. don't. We don't know what we have left. No. But the fact that you're 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 still on this journey and you're kind of other than the chemo, you're you're kind of pain free, right? Right. Amen. Mm-hmm. And yeah. your husband has got to be rejoicing over this, I would imagine, yes, as far as going through it and pains free and everything. He's a good man. Yeah. Yeah, he he's a good is. man. He stood by me. He's taking care of me. Amen. He Amen. does everything for I me. I love to hear that. You know, yep. I, uh, husbands and wives, mm-hmm. the commitment that you have together, you know, but I, we could preach a whole service on that. Yeah. As we wrap up, what are you thinking? Like, what's your thought process as you're, as you're here today? And is there a message you want to go forth? Is there any thoughts? Is there... You know, obviously, mm-hmm. we want to pray for you, and we we certainly are going to be doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what else is there that you're just your thoughts on? Well, I just keep coming back to that Proverbs three and five and six, and trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And 
that's what I've been trying to do. And that's kind of my message to people. If they can just trust in the Lord, when you come, when you come on these trials and tribulations that seem insurmountable, um, where you feel like you're drowning, you know, reach out to the Lord. And I know it's hard. I know from my previous experience that sometimes you can feel like there's that wall there, but yeah. I don't know how I penetrated that wall. It didn't have it this time. It just wasn't there this time. I don't know yeah. if I was more filled with the Holy Spirit Amen. or or what happened. But maybe it was the first word, right? Trust. Mm -hmm. Maybe now you're 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 learning to trust right. more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to make it into a spiritual race, um, you're way out in front as far as that trust goes. Mm -hmm. Because God is using something in your life to build that, right? I mean, right. the perseverance you talked mm -hmm. about earlier is being built because you're going through what you're going through. We, uh, I often quote the uh, old Norwegian proverb, smooth seas does not a skillful sailor make. You know, right, right. we don't mm -hmm. grow and become skillful when everything is calm and simple. No, we don't. The greatest growth mm -hmm. comes, you know, count it all joy when you fall into various right. trials. And you're going mm -hmm. through these things and... Your husband's uh, yes. going through them with you as he one. He is, and he's grown a lot spiritually too through this. I've seen, him, you know, been able to watch his growth, Amen. and his faith. And uh, has it impacted you in a way also, though, where like now, do you find yourself bolder about things? Like in other words, not that you don't care, but when you're faced with what you're faced with, the things that seem big in life are small now. Yeah, that's true. But you know, I still have that fear of you know, rejection to go up to somebody who like I me in high know. school, my fear of rejection. Yeah. Every yeah. girl I asked out. <laughs> uh, it's like, well, you know what I mean then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, to approach a stranger to like, you know, and sure. tell them about the Lord. I'm still, you know, I still have that fear Amen. in me. Listen, you that know? causes you to rely on the Holy Spirit. That much, it right? does. It does. Well, let me tell you, I, I wanted to do this and I was apprehensive. But I'm so glad that we did this. Oh, thank and you. And what was it? Was it easier than you thought it would be? Yes. You did it yes. with grace mm -hmm. and dignity. Oh, thank you. You were awesome. I just pretend that just I wasn't over there with yeah, the camera. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But you really did, and I think you're going to make a a big impact in people's lives that get a chance mm -hmm. to watch this. And I would encourage people um, that you're watching, if you're sitting in the sanctuary or uh, you're watching on YouTube or whatever it is. I would encourage you to turn other people on to it um, that are struggling with things because you're hearing this story of, of just this brutal honesty in one way, but this refreshing uh, simplicity of it that here you have this wonderful woman that is not allowing the fear to dictate to her, that's not moving towards the lack of faith or the questioning of faith, but she's actually being uh, refortified by her faith. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Um, you know, what would you do in this moment? How would you react in this moment? Well, here we have this wonderful testimony of someone. That's exactly what she's done. So um, thank you so much for coming oh, in. Welcome. Tom, thank you for allowing us to, uh, to work this with your wife and to talk to her and you being here. And, you know, we'll be praying for you, obviously, as much. And, um, and you guys are on this journey together. Mm -hmm. So uh, we understand that. And um, as we often say, anything that we can do as a church, we certainly want to be there for you guys. Oh, so I'm going to close with a been. word of prayer. Okay. And um, unless you have something else you feel you want to share. Just <coughs> to keep, you know, keep your hope in the Lord and trust the Lord. And like I said, lean not unto your own understanding. And I think that's the only thing that gets me through is my faith. Amen. You know, otherwise I'd be locked in a closet somewhere sobbing. And Yeah. Well, you went from treating it with your dad kind mm -hmm. of how, where you were at that point mm -hmm. and look how much you've grown yes since then. yeah so you you sort of quantify mm -hmm. it that's that truly is awesome yeah yeah the lord brought that to my memory amen yeah.